Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit team demo meeting. Hope folks are having a good week so far, enjoying the spring or fall weather, depending on your neck of the woods. We've got some good updates and demos to share today from the teams. So let's hop on in. On to Metasploit framework activity uh, from our framework focused development team, Alan Foster will be walking us through the latest and greatest with framework. Al? Hey, thanks, Chris. Uh, yep, uh, first we'll cover the new modules that have been landed in the past two releases to Metasploit Framework, um, starting off with the work of our very own Spencer McIntyre, who added a new deserialization vulnerability module, which targets Apache off-biz versions prior to version 17.12.06, I believe. Um, we'll have a demo of this later. Community member Calva Security has also contributed a new RCE module for Nagios XI versions prior to 5.80 um, that exploits a command injection vulnerability when uploading plugins to allow authenticated administrative users to gain remote code execution. And we'll see a demo of this later. And community member R4JOXOO has contributed a new Google Chrome exploit um, for a specific version of Google Chrome 87042808, as we all know and love. Uh, and this module starts a web page with malicious JavaScript, and then whenever visited by a user, will execute that arbitrary code. Uh, this requires the no sandbox Chrome flag to be used. So this probably isn't going to be used against users per se, as there's no sandbox escape at the minute. Uh, but could be potentially used on CI environments or something like that in creative ways to get um, sandbox escapes there. Um, uh, we have got a two new modules uh, by our very own Christophe de la Fuente, who has added um, two similar exploits for GOGs and GIT, which are both self-hosted Git framework similar to GitHub, I believe. Um, and this leverages a Git hook setting to achieve authenticated remote code execution against vulnerable versions. Um, and in this scenario, valid credentials and permissions are required to actually create the Git hooks for this exploit to work. Uh, community contributor Julia Voisin has added a new post module exploit that leverages an arbitrary read in Hazard RL prior to 0936. And this vulnerability is identified as CV 2021 uh, which allows an attacker to read any file in the target file system about specific privileges. A uh, community member, Vladimir Ivanov, has added a new post module for extracting insecurely stored credentials, such as the SLD user connection and the Solman user connection, which I believe is the SAP Solution Manager account. And I believe you can also compare it, combine that with an existing module for RCE. For enhancements and features, <coughs> community contributor, Black Arch, list sorry blacklist arch has added support for the spoa create technique to the ms sql exec module which allows for a more stealthy alternative to traditional xp command shell stored procedures community contributor because has updated the uh the the dupe scam uh buffer overflow module which now has support for six more vulnerable versions <coughs> And in this case, it's been updated to support auto-targeting, uh, as well as uh, internal updates to using uh, module traits and references. Uh, community contributor Arch Cloud Labs has updated the screen spy module to allow for users to specify the PID of the process they would like to migrate into before taking screenshots, uh, rather than forcing users to migrate into the explorer.exe process. And if no PID is specified, then Screen Spy will default to taking screenshots from the current process. And I believe we'll have a demo of that. Um, yes, we will. And community contributor Gaislin has made some improvements to payloads, uh, specifically to the payloads shell bind TCP random port. Uh, that is now one byte smaller. And he has also improved the uh, Linux x64 exec payload um, to have a null free version available for use, uh, which is good if you're doing buffer overflows. For enhancements and features, um, yours truly, myself, Alan Foster, has updated the 
Apache Tomcat module to have default R ports and AGP ports specified. So this will allow it to be used in a sort of automated fashion against targets with good default settings. Uh, our very own Spencer McIntyre has updated the auxiliary Redis login uh, module to first check if authentication is required before attempting to brute force credentials. And Spencer McIntyre has also improved the interpreter's error messages to be more descriptive, and we'll have a demo of that later. And for bugs fixed, our very own Dean Welch has Fix an issue when loading the, sorry, when running the show payloads command or the MSF Venom list payloads command where one individual module failing to load would actually take out the entire process and stop the rest from showing. Uh, so now this is now more gracefully handled and it will continue on and ignore that. And I have also updated the JSON API service to correctly interact with the configured framework database options that you've got set within your um, either your database YAML file or your config file within your MSF4 directory. Um, and I've also added support for running the MSF DB web service component directly in the foreground with the no daemon flag. Uh, and that makes it more useful in production-based environments where you want to run that process separately and have a, a status code return to you if it's failed to run, et cetera. Um, our very own Dean Welsh has fixed an issue where users were only getting three attempts when brute forcing uh, MySQL login. Um, and that turned out to be a update required uh, in order to fix that. And in the next slide for bugs fixed, uh, community contributor JRA89 has fixed a regression that caused the NTP protocol fuzzer modules to crash from the in run. And a thanks to Dean Welsh, who also um, fixed some other modules in that area. And our very own Jeffrey Martin has updated the auto target host logic to additionally handle the scenario where our host could be potentially nil. Um, so thanks for that. And community contributor Hoodie has fixed a logic bug in the Cracker libraries where Hashcat wasn't able to be run due to invalid version expectations. And I myself have updated a problem with the MSFDB services command. Um, specifically, there was an issue in linking up associations of the Rails models behind the scenes, specifically whenever you were targeting a remote database, which wouldn't impact uh, a majority of our users, but was impacting nonetheless. And in the next slide, uh, community contributor Justin Stephen has fixed a bug uh, within the Python interpreter reverse HTTP payload handler, where if the LURI option did not start with a slash, the payload would actually fail the stage. So thanks for fixing that. And community contributor Ryan A. Nicholson has fixed a crash in the auxiliary gather enum DNS module. And as always, uh, you can stay up to date with the weekly Metasploit information at blog.rapid7.com, where we post weekly wrap-up blog posts. And we appreciate everyone that makes Metasploit better through their contributions to the project. So thank you. And I will jump into demos. And our first one is from Grant, who's going to give us a quick overview of the Natchez XI plugins, finally authenticated RCE. Yeah, so if you just want to play the video so long. So this was a vulnerability affecting a number of Nagios XI versions. Um, we basically, so this one, we're just going to go ahead and search for the CVE ID. And um, essentially what this bug uh, relates to is Nagios prior to 5.8.0 had a vulnerability where if you uploaded a plugin as an administrative user, um, due to a lack of validation on the file name of the plugin itself, you could essentially conduct um, command line, sorry, command injection, um, and you could upload a plugin with a malicious name that contained the command to execute and it would execute that as the apache user so you can just see here we're setting a couple options um you do need to be authenticated as a nagios uh, administrative user 
we then check that the target's vulnerable and then just quickly execute the exploit. Um, and you can see we get execution. Sorry, um, it's, I should just explain that actually. In some cases, it is uh, WW data. In other cases, depending on the version, it is um, Apache. So it depends on the specific version of Nagios that you're exploiting, but it should be either WW data or Apache. And you can also see um, in that deleted line there, the command that we actually executed. So that will be the file name. Um, and then we just go ahead and delete that once we're done. That's great. Thanks. Uh, I believe we have another demo. Yes, for the interpreter error message improvements, which I believe is the work of Spencer. Um, take it away, Grant. Yeah, so I'm Spencer McIntyre. I made a couple of updates to the interpreter session verification, um, specifically with the messages that are output. So if you just want to play this video, um, to give some context, uh, we recently did some work on improving session verification to make sure that uh, sessions actually support the features that we wanted. However, uh, Spencer noted that some of the uh, messages that would be in output were not that informative to users and did not instruct them exactly as to how to solve their problems. So if we look here, we can see that we made a couple of improvements. So I'm just going to go ahead and set up a little Java um, session. The reason we're doing that, it's not specific to Java. It's just that Java doesn't support uh, some specific features. Um, so we're first going to disable the loading of the STD the API extension. Um, this just simulates a scenario in which the STD API um, extension fails to load for some reason. Uh, this isn't common, but it can happen at times. Um, this will often cause a number of commands to fail, but previously the output message uh, when this occurred was not very clear. So we just run the results host command. Um, you'll see it correctly says it may not be compatible with this module, but the next message that will output in a few seconds um, should now tell us that the uh, STD API extension is not loaded. So you can see it, it says, hey, you know, you haven't uh, loaded the STD API extension, so this is why it's failed. Um, so if we just interact with our session again, load the STD API extension. And now we also go ahead and we just set a couple other options needed for this module to run correctly. What we should get if we run this now is that we should see that the extension, um, sorry, the STD API net result host uh, command or extension for the um, this version of the interpreter, which is Java, uh, is not supported. So we're not able to actually run that command on the specific version of the interpreter, aka Java interpreter. Um, so hopefully those error messages should be a little bit more helpful and should help users debug their errors a bit easier. It's good. It's good to see the error messages getting iteratively improved to help our users. Awesome. And one more demo from yourself, Grant, which is going over the Screen Spy uh, PID session migration upgrades. Yeah. So, just to, if you want to play the video, just to give some context to this, um, essentially what was happening was users were reporting that sometimes if you try and take a screenshot, um, before that, what this uh, module would do was it would try and uh, find the explorer process and then migrate into that and then take the screenshot. The, the problem with that is that it's not always desired to migrate into uh, the explorer process. You may want to migrate into a specific process. Um, do two limitations or whatnot on the system and then take a screenshot from that process. Um, 
So you can just see here that uh, the new command by default, if you don't specify the process that you want to migrate into, it will just take the screenshot from the current session. Um, so from the current process that the session is running as. Um, now there is one little bug here, which you'll see in a second. Uh, we are aware of this and we are working on a fix for it. But if you are connected to the database over the HTTPS connection, you will need to disconnect and use the local connection instead. Um, just for some reason, it doesn't save it into the loot at the moment. So you'll see, I'll just quickly run the DB disconnect. If you just want to fast forward the video a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, so you can see I've just connected the database and now I'm just running the command again. Um, but now once that's done, it will capture the six screenshots and save them into the loot. Um, again, just the, just the case of being connected over the HT, HTTPS uh, database versus the local database. So now if I run this again, You can see that we have the screenshots and these are taken as the current process. Um, so I just want to fast forward a little bit more here. Um, we're just going to go ahead and just be the screenshot. Um, this is just to show that it did actually take the screenshot successfully. Um, so now the next thing we're going to do is we're just going to interact with our session. Actually, we'll just clear out the loop before we do that, just so that we have a clean state. Um, and then we're going to get a list of processes from the current session. So we're just going to choose this code meter CC just a random process for the purpose of this test. And we're going to tell uh, the module to migrate into that before taking the screenshots. And then we're going to just run the modules. So you can see the migration happened successfully and we're just capturing the screenshots if you just want to fast forward just a little bit because this process does take a bit of time. You can see that now we have the screenshots so I just want to fast forward a little bit more. Um, we're just going to show that we've got the screenshots here and then I'm going to open it up in Firefox. So just to showcase that this does indeed work. So you can see we have our screenshot there. Um, and then also if we actually look at the sessions, um, and we just interact with this quickly. You can see that it's the process ID of the process that we migrate in, into. So the screenshot was taken from the process that we migrated into and not from the original process that we gained the shell as. That's good. That, Thanks, Colonel. Yeah, not a question, but that looks, that seems like a, a really useful uh, capability. Thanks for demoing. Yeah, no one other module that's kind of interesting as well is um, there's one that can do like a almost like a Zoom screen sharing session almost where you can see the mouse move in real time. So rather than just a specific process, you can just see the user screen as they see it, which is also pretty cool. Um, nice. Awesome. Uh, next up, we have Spencer McIntyre showing us the Apache Authbiz RCE module. 
All right, thank you. Uh, yep, this is the uh, second Apache of Biz module that we have. Uh, the vulnerability is very similar to the the previous RCE that we have. Uh, but this one uh, covers a couple of newer versions um, of Apache of Biz than, than the previous one. Um, if you'd like to go ahead and start the demo. Uh, so the uh, the underlying vulnerability is an unauthenticated uh, API uh, method in the, the SOAP endpoint. Um, so we can issue a request to it and it will deserialize Java code and that will execute our operating system commands within the context of Apache of Biz. Uh, so this is gonna be an unauthenticated vulnerability. Uh, so we can go ahead and run the check method. Uh, the check method is going to send data that is going to be deserialized and then based on the response we can determine that it, it is vulnerable and then we can go ahead and exploit it and in this case we used it to drop a meterpreter payload uh, so we can see that we are running as root in in this case but this is most likely because this is in a docker environment uh, usually it would be uh, whoever started the apache of biz um, and then we have the second option to go ahead and run just a, a generic operating system command. So we're going to go ahead and switch the payload over to see how that works. And this time we're going to run Python and we're going to go ahead and again, get an interactive shell this way. Uh, so pretty nice, uh, reliable little RCE vulnerability there. Oh, thank you. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you for the demo, Spencer and, and Grant and uh, and Alan for walking us through all that. Uh, really great stuff. Always enjoy seeing seeing what's been going on. Uh, here we'll segue over to Attacker KB, the Attacker Knowledge Base, a website for discussing which bones matter and why. Just visit attackerkb.com. Uh, last demo meeting, the team showed off some nice performance improvements and, uh, and enhancements when reporting exploited in the wild. Uh, those all have landed, been deployed to the website. Um, totally worth checking out there at attackerkb.com. Swing by and um, enjoy those things. Uh, from our Attacker KB dev team, uh, Matthew's going to give us a, a quick update on some of the current work in progress. Uh, Matthew? Hey, yeah, so we're in progress on a Twitter OAuth integration. Uh, this will allow users to create accounts on Attacker KB using their Twitter instead of GitHub. So we're just uh, trying to open it up to more people. And uh, from the Rapid7 perspective, we're also working on research for IPIMS integration so that uh, users with those accounts uh, will be able to log in uh, to Attacker KB as well. Uh, that's what we got right now. Cool and super exciting to be opening the platform up to, to other authentication uh, mechanisms. Excellent.